Fantastic group, fantastic room. Let me begin, though, by thanking our hosts. SOCAP's created one of the significant means to connect those of us who are committed to turning this nascent field into a flourishing ecosystem of commerce and social change. It's one thing to say you want to transform the way the world does business, but it's quite another to help shepherd that transformation. So thank you very much, and that is what SOCAP has done. You know, in this field, we often speak the language of numbers and figures of balance sheets and return rates. So I'd like to begin with a story instead. On April 18th, 1906, just a little over a century ago, this city was really racked by one of the most devastating earthquakes in recorded history. 80% of San Francisco was reduced to rubble. Massive fires burned for days and nights. The quake permanently altered the course of the Central Coast's largest river, as it did millions of lives. Over 3,000 people were killed, and hundreds, and hundreds of thousands more were displaced. Frightened ref refugees assembled at this very site here in Fort Mason. Among the many locals frantically attempting to salvage their livelihoods this day was a young Italian banker named A.P. Giannini. Awakened by the shaking and with the railroad tracks destroyed, Giannini walked 17 miles from his San Mateo home to check on his two-year-old bank. Miraculously, he discovered that the building had not sustained major damage. He and several employees quickly rescued $80,000 in gold and silver from his vaults, disguising the deposits under piles of produce and wheeling his wagon just ahead of the flames. The following morning, while the city was still smoldering and other financiers were hunkered down, Giannini hurried to the wharf just a few miles from here. He set up a rough wooden plank over a couple of barrels, scrawled a Bank of Italy sign, and opened for business. On a face and a signature, as that story goes, he began making loans to Italians and other immigrants in this North Beach neighborhood, people whose stories of heartbreak he had heard on his walk the previous day. Go home and get that house fixed, he told them. Rebuild your business. And with his counsel and credit, he jump-started the recovery of San Francisco's social and economic life. As one biographer observed in words so true that the Rockefeller Foundation's philosophy could have written them, Giannani's stirring act after the earthquake was a classic example of resilience and innovation that were the basic components of his banking style. Within decades, the Bank of Italy had become one of the biggest banks in the world, and by then it went by a different name, the Bank of America. I tell this story to celebrate a homegrown, century-old impact investment, because in spirit, if not by our exact modern definition, that's what the Bank of Italy's loans were. They were pioneering loans to farmers and small businesses, to women and minorities capital that financed the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge when nobody else would, capital that provided seed funding to two young guys named Hewlett and Packard. We're all here today because we recognize a renewed need for the sort of capital that he understood, capital with a conscience. From the Tenderloin to the slums of Mumbai, we see hunger and homelessness and environmental degradation. Difficulties so overwhelming that even the task of rebuilding an entire city pales by comparison. These grave and pressing social challenges seem all the more insurmountable when we consider that even adding up all of our philanthropy and all of our aid, we have trillions of dollars in social needs and only billion with which to address them. There is no denying that the math is stark trillions against billions. But we at Rockefeller do see a path forward, or rather we see a continuation of a path that has repeatedly given us safe passage through pe previous periods of inflection over our own 100-year history. That path, in a word we've heard so many times here already, is innovation. Innovations born of new ways of thinking have long pushed global society in exciting and eventually promising directions. 
Innovation has always been decisive during moments of change, and today is absolutely no exception. In Rockefeller's history, it was a process of innovation during moments of great inflection that led to the creation of the field of public health, the discovery of a vaccine for yellow fever, the eradication of hookworm in the United States, and the Green Revolution in Latin America and Asia. Clearly, if we hope to achieve impact of similarly dramatic scale in the 21st century, we must do what our predecessors did so well. We must see the world anew and experiment based on these new and different perspectives and find, fund, and then scale the innovations that emerge. And our 21st century goal at Rockefeller is not just to find a specific new invention or to deploy a new product that will be world changing. Our goal is also to facilitate a process of innovation, one that will lead a global revolution in the way that we mobilize and deploy capital for social impact. And most often, innovation process that is most fundamental to social change and to market transformations alike is recombinant innovation. Consider Apple now the world's most valuable company. We obviously memorialize Steve Jobs as a brilliant inventor, and he certainly is credited with dozens of patents, just as Samsung. When it comes, however, to the products that we associate most with his genius, his talent was not just invention, it was recombinant innovation. For example, Steve Jobs didn't invent the personal computer. He built and perfected existing innovation, existing inventions, including a graphical user interface pioneered by the Xerox Corporation years before the first Macintosh ever rolled off the assembly line. And Jobs didn't invent touchscreen technology or mobile communication devices, but the iPhone and the iPad are examples of a process of recombinant innovation that took existing elements and reassembled them in truly unprecedented ways to create entirely new product categories. Impact investing is a prime example of recombinant innovation. It takes Wall Street financing models and applies them in powerfully new ways to social problem solving. Some of the first players in this space were recombination experts, you might say, in sectors like microfinance and community development. They were Jacqueline Novogratz looking at patient capital and starting Acumen, or Willie Foote of Root Capital, looking at trade financing for rural cooperatives. All of the amazing creative inventors who are with us here today and all of the amazing creative investors who are here with us today ask themselves, how can we tap into private capital flows to create both financial and social return? As you can see, really, from the depth and diversity of this audience, impact investors are coming up with a staggering range of answers to that question. And you'll hear more about that shortly from Anthony and Catherine. What all of these organizations and investors demonstrate, and what we at the Rockefeller Foundation believe deeply, is that the future of social change will involve leveraging the marketplace. It must catalyze market-driven solutions to social challenges. Perhaps it's the invisible hand lending a helping hand. Whether we're transforming so capital markets to account for social returns or cross-pollinating and collaborating with diverse actors in the new marketplace of ideas, or harnessing the competition and innovation of the global market for new kinds of goods and services, the market is where our money and our morals can meet to make an even greater impact on our social challenges. And from Market Street to the souks and mercados of the developing world, and with all due respect to our visionary founder, John D. Rockefeller, we are no longer your father's philanthropy. The Rockefeller Foundation is proud to pioneer the philanthropy of the future, and like all foundations, we have the luxury of taking the longer view. So for the past five years, we've been helping to build the critical infrastructure needed to accelerate the recombination of these impact investing innovations. 
We've collaborated with institutional investors like TIA Cref and JP Morgan to create the Global Impact Investors Network, or GIN, which serves as a forum for identifying and addressing systemic barriers that hinder the industry's efficiency and effectiveness. The GIN Investors Council now has over 50 leading impact investors, ranging from banks to pension funds to family offices. Altogether, they have $58 billion in impact investments under management. We were an early supporter of a new global reporting standard known as IRIS for measuring and communicating the social impact of investments. The GIN recently launched an IRIS registry where organizations can publicly list the metrics that they use to track their performance. And already, 40 organizations have registered, including the Inter-American Development Bank, Acumen Fund, and Pacific Community Ventures. We also help fund the development of the Global Impact Investing Rating System, or GEARS, to provide objective and credible third-party ratings of the social and environmental impact of investments. 65 impact investing funds have committed to GEARS ratings, and over 300 companies have been rated under these standards. At the beginning of next year, GEARS will launch a new product called GEARS Analytics, an online platform that will enable easier comparison and reporting on, Im uh, on impact companies. For those of you who are new to some of these industry infrastructure words, um, for whom impact performance may feel a little bit more like alphabet soup, I encourage you to read the four-part series launching tomorrow in the Stanford Social Innovation Review online. And most recently, we expanded our horizons beyond what people would call impact investing in the traditional sense, funding the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which promises one day to make the disclosure of corporate and social and environmental performance as commonplace as standard financial reporting. And we look forward to celebrating SASB's official launch this Thursday here in San Francisco. With better tools to measure social impact, investors will have the metrics they need to gauge where their capital will get more social and environmental bang for the buck. But we must also connect impact investors to the demand side, the businesses and entrepreneurs like so many of you in this room who can put the capital to work to create both solutions and profits. That's why the Rockefeller Foundation has helped fund the Impact Investment Exchange in Singapore, which will soon launch Asia's first stock market for social capital. We think this is a really promising development because typically for-profit investors have either overlooked the handful of social enterprises that are listed on traditional stock exchanges, or worse, they've tried to redirect and undermine their social mission. By now aggregating social businesses on a single exchange and linking interested investors to it, the IIX stock, social stock exchange will allow socially conscious investors to more directly have their capital linked to social enterprises. And of course, we were an early supporter of Andy, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. They're targeting the missing middle, those small and growing businesses in the developing world that are too big for microfinance loans and not big enough for private commercial investments. Small and growing businesses account for more than half the GDP and half the employment in developed countries, but less than a fifth of the GDP and employment in the developing world. Through its network of initiatives that provide capital and build capacity, Andy is addressing this neglected area and helping to jumpstart a potent new engine of economic and social development. Taken together, this infrastructure has helped to accelerate the process of innovation in the field of impact investing and in the field of social enterprise. Another area of acceleration and recombination of leveraging private capital for social good has been the creation of new kinds of public-private partnerships that innovate in the use of both private and government capital. For example, last year, Rockefeller made a PRI grant to the African Agricultural Capital Fund, 
which was raising $25 million to provide long-term risk capital to scale agribusinesses. In the spirit of enterprise philanthropy, we made an equity investment in a subordinated tranche, helping to leverage in finance-first capital from JP Morgan, which was further aided by a risk guarantee from SAID. Now this creative collective instrument is supporting smallholder farmers, it's creating jobs and contributing to food security, as well as delivering financial returns. The AACF is a prime example of how government and civil society and the private sector can work together to provide innovative solutions to pressing challenges, in this case, pressing challenges of agriculture in Africa. And it represents the first stage of a potential pooled equity partnership for African agriculture. Maybe the Marshall Plan fed Europe, but we like to think that the Morgan Plan will feed Africa. As another example of recombinant innovation in public-private partnerships, governments and private markets, foundations and NGOs are beginning to collaborate on social impact bonds, which allow governments to generate investments from philanthropic and private means to scale proven effective interventions for pressing social needs. One of the first social impact bond pilots began at the UK's Peterborough prison with Rockefeller's support. This particular pilot focuses on reducing recidivism in adult males who have served short-term prison sentences. Recently, Mayor Bloomberg announced that Goldman Sachs will provide nearly $10 million in loans to implement a similar program for Rikers Island, where almost half the inmates are reincarcerated within, re -incarcerated within a year. But the social impact bond model can be applied to many issue areas where government holds a responsibility for the well-being of its citizenry and where municipal bond markets do not reach. In fact, President Obama announced that the White House is working on its own $100 million social impact bond pilot. We're seeing an expansion of this market in coming years, which will prevent future costs for government and problems for society and create a financial incentive for better service delivery. In addition to social impact bonds, another example of innovative new partnerships among public and private institutions involves social enterprises leveraging private balance sheets through guarantees or other credit enhancement structures. For example, the Gates Foundation recently backed a $90 million bond issuance by the Aspire Charter School Network in California through an unfunded guarantee backed by the strength of Gates's balance sheet. This is a pri really a prime example of another critical role than, that philanthropy can play where our public and private counterparts aren't ready or not willing or able to do so. A third impact innovation model is being widely deployed by the public and private and philanthropic sectors, and that is the use of competitive crowdsourcing to unleash new sources of capital for social good. One example was our recent funding of a crowdsourced competition that allowed the G20 to search for new game-changing ideas for how to give small and medium-sized social enterprises the financing and the structures that they need to grow and scale most effectively. Using the Ashoka web-based platform, we presented this problem to the world and in response, G20 country members received hundreds of ideas. They picked 17 winners and then they committed half a billion dollars to fund them. One finalist, just to give you an example, was an organization called Entrepreneurial Finance Lab, which is pioneering an alternative to traditional credit scoring models in developing countries where credit information is often unavailable. Instead, they've developed a statistically proven tool that assesses credit risk by looking at the entrepreneur's intellectual and psych psychological characteristics. This has the potential to unlock a whole new form of lending to those with little and is really potentially a very effective model for social enterprise leaders in the developing world. Crowdsourcing represents an exciting tool 
for uncovering similar pioneering solutions for uncorking bottlenecks in the flow of small private capital. We're already seeing this in popular crowdfunding websites like Kickstarter and CircleUp and RocketHub. These are just a few illustrations of what we're seeing and learning as we see this field of impact investing coming to its next level of maturity. We are admittedly in the early stages, but we at Rockefeller are looking for those further areas that remain to be developed as we launch the next phase of our work here. First, more capital needs to be unlocked from sources like large institutional investors. Second, the demand side of impact investing must be strengthened, both through focused support of social enterprise and also the exploration of innovative hybrid business models. Third, impact must be assessed more effectively, creating an evidence base of what works and what doesn't work. And fourth, the enabling environment for all of these investments must be improved through dedicated policy research and knowledge sharing among governments seeking to support the field. And the whole ecosystem must become part of the movement we now commit to build. As my colleague Antony once put it, product building is a five-year task. Movement building, on the other hand, is a generation-long challenge that requires much bolder vision, much more patience, and a great deal of ambition. What this moment of inflection demands is exactly such a movement, a movement that creates a fundamental change in the mindset of society and allows us to really recognize a new way for society to mobilize resources to address our social and environmental challenges a worldwide marketplace, not just for goods, but for good. In the spirit of the young financier who set up a makeshift bank on a wharf, let us all commit together to being bankers to the dispossessed, investors in the indigent, and shareholders in society. Doing so will take all of us, foundations, investors, entrepreneurs, it requires developing new ways to measure and value and new methods to save and invest capital so that we can incentivize the financial transactions that truly, truly improve the lives of individuals, the fabric of communities, and the health of our planet. But if we insist on the resilience and the relentless innovation that have been the hallmark of every generation, I am confident that we can do what Giannini did and win the century to come. Thank you.